Okay, well, welcome back. I hope that um, you had some fruitful discussions in your rooms. And we have some time now to talk about those challenges together and to talk about some of the recommendations that came up in your different groups. So um, what we can do now is to, um, I am going to share this, um, is to um, give each group a chance to, to feedback and, um, see this okay um, so so what we're going to talk about is go from from each group and discuss the, the challenge that you discussed and the um, and the recommendations and so um, if we have the um, the Mentimeter results from uh, participation um, I'll invite Aching to um, to take three to five minutes to um, share what her group did. Perfect, I'll just be one second. Um, I'll, would you like me to share my screen, Laura, so you can see the results? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and Aching, I'll just need to scroll if, um, for the last two if you need them, so just let me know when to scroll. Um, Aching, you're, you're muted. You're on mute, Aching. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So the recommendations included peer-to-peer -peer awareness activity to uh, address psycho psychosocial support. Um, we also said that we need to invest in local capacity, uh, communities, and community-based organization. These are the structures and people that are closest to children. So that is where our investment needs to go uh, the most. Um, we also need to work closely with other sectors to find ways to ensure child participation and child protection, for example, education. And if I may ask, uh, if I may add health, due to the fact that we are dealing with diseases, so we are not an island. We 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 are in this together with many other sectors that we need to collaborate with. Um, there's also need to educate parents and children on child participation and enabling um, internet access so that children can seek information and and express their needs. Uh, there are children who have access to internet. Um, so if we can educate the parents um, and the children and enable internet. Oh, apologies, Aching, you just got switched to mute. That was 100% my mistake. Apologies, everyone. <laughs> no problem. Um, again, another point about uh, empowering local structures like community-based uh, child protection um, organs. Um, we need to ensure multiple child-friendly and inclusive channels for providing feedback. This should include modalities that work in more remote settings where internet may not be accessible. Um, and then lastly, in this uh, screen, we need to strengthen child-friendly feedback and complaint mechanism. Um, we also need to use peer-to-peer uh, -peer approaches to share information and channel feedback and provide psychosocial support. Um, I think that's, that's it from us. Thanks so much, Aching. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you very much, Aching, and the group who explored child participation. Um, I know that with the child participation group, and even looking at um, how we 
we feel so strongly that children should be at the center of the infectious disease outbreak response, there is still um, you know, many ethical conundrums that were explored. This time. And so I'm sure that came up in the discussion as well. And hopefully that will continue to, um, to come up throughout all our discussions. Um, I will invite uh, the next group, which is That's Judy. That's Judy's group. Judy, MHPSS, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. Put up those results and welcome Judy. Okay, wonderful. So if Jessica can put up the results. We had three groups and three groups who were very engaged and uh, looking at the issue of psychosocial support uh, with children and with families and with um, communities. So this is the priorities that they, that they looked at. So to ensure that this service is prioritized in future IDOs. So this came very strongly from all groups is that this needs to really be prioritized uh, because the stress level and the mental health level is really going up significantly. Um, another group said that to train practitioners on technology and advocacy for donors to get funding for this. And I thought that really linked to the technology group. So it will be interesting to see what they say about that. Um, integration with other uh, co-hosts that, oh, my video is not on. Okay, thank you. Um, integration with yeah, other I've sectors. Well, I've got yes. to go because I'm in a conference that's starting again. Okay, sorry. Okay, I just heard someone giving me instructions. Anyway, I'm going to keep going. Integration with other sectors, especially education and health. So that would really flip over into the multi-sectoral discussion. And then involvement with the community from the very beginning with the government and institutions. Um, then the, and the other, another group had capacity building, uh, again on technology, again uh, integration. And this one brought up the involvement of faith leaders in psychosocial, which is really important. And I just want to um, go that the, it is an essential service. That was a big discussion that it needed to be an essential service for children and caregivers. Again, advocacy to decision makers and an increased focus for the well being of staff and volunteers. So, as you can see, there was a really strong um, discussion. And these were the three priorities that the different groups set together. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much, Judy. And just looking at our, our numbers going up, I wanted to give a quick recap. Um, my name is Laura, I'm a COVID-19 focal point with the Alliance with Judy, who's just presented. And um, we are currently feeding back from our first group work session where we were doing thematic um, uh, discussions on key issues. And so we've done um, mental health, psychosocial well-being, and we've done participation. Uh, the next will be sectoral silos, followed by socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 and infectious disease outbreaks, as well as um, the last group will talk about technology. Um, and so this is a feedback session and then we'll go into new breakout or new, um, new rooms after this and after a break. So um, if you didn't participate in the first group work session, you will be very welcome to join a room for the second and we really uh, will value your feedback. So please hang with us. Um, so now I will invite the second, the third group, uh, Elena with sectoral silence. Yes, thanks, uh, Laura. Um, Richard, if you could share the Mentimeter slides so that I can recollect my thoughts around the discussion that has taken place. Um, I don't know if Richard's here. I've got your, your group three, but I can't see any results. Did people... Yes, we had um, some results on the Mentimeter, yes. 
Um, I can try and summarize, like while maybe we try and find uh, our slide. Um, yeah. um, so, first of all, we were lucky to be able to actually have a conversation in French as well, because Audrey facilitated that part of the discussion, which was really useful um, to engage more uh, French speaking colleagues. Uh, there were Mm, the, co the suggestions that I can recall from the top of my head, like where, firstly, I guess, um, to uh, advocate for the importance of um, the centrality of protection with donors. So I guess that to understand you know, to make sure that like when we actually design programs, we uh, sort of have them rotate around this, um, the, around protection itself. Then there were uh, suggestions on um, um, uh, um, uh, there were suggestions around uh, um, working there were specific suggestions actually like around like working with sectors such as education more prominently or um, ensuring better uh, communications around the referral pathways for um, for the various sectors so that um, channels between sectors are actually communicating better. Um, and then thanks, Susanna, so that you write the summary of like your uh, group work, like in the chat box as well. So you can read like also what Susanna has shared, like through the chat box itself. Um, what else? Um, I'm just trying to recall my thoughts. There was a lot shared. It was a very short time, 10 minutes, like to discuss such a broad topic. There was one point which was really interesting around intercoalitions and uh, um, uh, of agencies and better coordination around agencies. Oh, thanks like for the slide. This is much, much more, much easier. Uh, <laughs> The first You've point done very that, well, Elena. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was struggling a little bit to recollect <laughs> the language that was used by our participants, which sounds so good. And then when I try to recollect it through my own thinking, it wasn't sounding just as <laughs> ne as neat. So the first point I was raised was one around language of child protection needs to be adapted like for specific sectors so that like you know it works for health colleagues so that it works for those food security and livelihood colleagues etc so it doesn't it's not too abstract like we do in our own forums and uh, multi-sectoral coordination as i was just saying it's certainly another priority that we need uh, to be worked on some one suggested uh, to have more in intersectoral Total meetings at response level. Uh, then um, INGOs capacity building efforts like for local partners on integrated responses, uh, etc. I mean certainly important like I'm not the one denying that given that I'm the learning and development focal point much more that we can do on that front promoting child protection minimum standards pillar four I guess uh, you know and that's definitely quite a lot of good suggestions in there that uh, we often don't resort to or our colleagues like in the field don't have the time to resort to. And as I was saying, the focusing with donors and uh, being proactive with pushing with other sectors around the importance of intersectoral work, which is uh, understood, but I guess, you know, it's not the, uh, you know, I also know that exercising is very important, but I don't always do it. So <laughs> I think it's pushing for that um, part of the implementation. And I think that's about it from me, Laura. Thanks so much, Elena. And thanks to the sectoral so silos group. There's a lot of richness there um, with how we can enhance intersectoral collaborations. It'd be really nice to see how those translate into priority actions later. So please keep that in mind for anyone who is listening to that, because that's a really key issue. Um, anything to add there, Judy? No, I think that that sounds good. Lots to think about. 
Great. And now we will have um, room four who discussed socioeconomic impacts. So welcome, Sylvia. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you, Laura. So in room four, we were discussing about the socioeconomic impact in different countries. We had the opportunity to use examples from different countries, but also like a global perspective. So it was a very fruitful discussion um, where we mentioned how as child protection practitioners were addressing some of these socioeconomic impacts through uh, collaboration, coordination with governments, but also working with the community level organizations. And um, we were also brainstorming of like what could be recommendations and how, what will we to prioritize? So we had like a really long list of actions, etc. but we want everyone to remember these like three. So the first one we want to prioritize like advocacy, ensure like all social protection schemes have child protection outcomes. So they like target deliberately child protection outcomes. So we know like a lot of governments around the world and there's like existing, so this is a good opportunity. Uh, so we want to push um, to ensure like they, to extend the coverage, etc. but to ensuring that they, there's also like deliberate child protection outcome in the social protection mechanisms. Uh, the second one is around participation of children and communities. Uh, to ensure like the most marginalized, those affected uh, mostly by socioeconomic impact, like families living from like informal work or like children engaged in child labor worst forms, they're like identify and are rich. So that's the second one on like participation. And lastly, uh, our like third priority to want to put forward is the social protection schemes at community level. So we want to learn from the existing practices that we've been doing like during COVID-19, where we've been supporting uh, community-based organizations and working through uh, communities. So we want to promote and support uh, community level social protection schemes that can mobilize resources and support um, those children that are mostly affected uh, to prevent and then provide also promote sustainability. Uh, so that's the um, quick uh, recap from our room four. Great, thanks so much, Sylvia. And thanks for bringing up uh, reaching the, the marginalized children um, within, uh, within those efforts. And I can see social protection being highlighted as a, as a key issue and intervention. So that's, that's great, thank you so much. And we will move on to uh, technology. Welcome, Domenico. Hello, everybody. So thank you, first of all, to the participants of the Room on Technology. We had a very nice uh, discussion uh, about challenges and recommendation faced during COVID-19 and even previous uh, IDOs. So what came out uh, in the discussion is as a challenge is indeed uh, uh, despite the connectivity, despite the network that was not always available for everyone to access, uh, we have also to remind that when it was accessible, maybe the language barriers, considering some indigenous uh, or different ethnics, uh, they were not really able even having the tools to access to the information that was on that. So there were, of course, troubles identified in device, microphones, connections, and so on. So. Uh, some of the technical issues were uh, obliging to shift from internet to radio, particularly because uh, uh, there was possibility for having solar radio in some cases, and uh, that were more reliable in order to cascade education information messages, key considerations, and so on for uh, beneficiaries. Uh, indeed, uh, the challenges oblige as a, the most used solution, the phones, uh, through, of course, like top-up cards and things in order to reach beneficiaries, particular project management and similar projects for PSS support. So some cases uh, were mentioning, uh, but still for the challenges, of course, of economic uh, uh, and budget uh, needs. Uh, so possible iPads distribution for uh, education and uh, child protection uh, purposes. And indeed, the phones became handy for particular types of uh, cash and economic uh, support through phones. So 
Among challenges, of course, we have to mention that sometimes it's not only the network's availability, but also the capacity of the population, the affected people, to use uh, internet, mobile, smartphone, application, and so on. So, and uh, this came also through the difficulties of building capacities on these soft skills through the technologies. So, uh, challenges uh, were mentioned specifically in uh, difficulties to report and identify cases of abuse and IPDs. And uh, so, parents prioritize other chores, duties rather than accessing services online. So, between recommendations, uh, we identified, uh, of course, the needs of training children, with, uh, but also training parents on needs basic support to understand what risks uh, exist when using online platforms. Uh, of course, came out discussions on uh, safeguarding uh, data, so the use services that do continue, such as healthcare and distribution, to deliver key CP messages and services. And uh, the, a recommendation for future uh, waves of IDOs is that we need to think creatively about messages, teaching other, se other sectors to assess risks uh, through technology and how we can keep uh, contact with the population. And of course, uh, all these messages, all these uh, uh, communication that moves through technology, internet, application, WhatsApp and so on, needs to be developed in a more child-friendly way and including disabilities uh, because not, uh, uh, not everybody can read uh, a message on the smartphone, not everybody can access through hands, uh, phones, and so on. So disability needs to be considered, and also a gender lens needs to be applied because technology is not gender blind. Also the access to their device, to digital literacy, is making different impacts according with the gender issues. And over. Thank you very much, uh, Domenico and the group who worked on, on technology. Um, and there's some wonderful comments coming in um, based on um, what Domenico was just reflecting on, but also the previous groups. Uh, thank you for bringing in the gender lens. Uh, I think that's really critical. And um, there was a lot of cross-cutting points there between the different topics. Um, so let's take a few minutes to explore that more in depth. Um, I wanted to invite um, participants, if there's someone who wants to add something to their group, um, to, uh, to do that. Um, and actually, I had a I noticed that, Susanna, you put in a comment about the CPMS standards. And um, that's something to hold on to throughout the day is how do the CPMS standards really apply to this topic? How will they apply to these recommendations? How are we enhancing those and drawing on those um, as we look forward to our um, to enacting these recommendations? And um, Susanna, can I invite you to, um, to add to that? Sure, yeah, I think we, um, we're we having a really interesting conversation in the chat box and also in the breakout sessions before um, around, the, around the promotion of pillar four around working across sectors um, in COVID-19 response and other infectious disease responses. And I think many, um, several colleagues kind of commented um, on a few points. One, that like this was a key lesson learned from Ebola, that child protection needed to be mainstreamed into the response from the start. And it's one that wasn't, well, it was learned, but it was not applied um, in, in the beginning of COVID. Um, and while there are some great examples now, I think there's a lot more work to kind of realize the, the promise of pillar four, which focuses on the centrality of protection and emphasizes really strongly that this is not um, child protection sort of offering other sectors um, or asking other sectors for a favor, but rather we have you know, a fair uh, amount of research and evidence that, that emphasizes that not incorporating child protection risks or having programming that is blind to child protection issues for other sectors um, compromises their outcomes. Um, so I think we've, we've gotten a good push from Federique and from some other colleagues uh, in the chat 
to, to look at how we realize that and how we do advocacy um, at the country level um, to make sure that these integrated approaches and child protection mainstreaming is happening more systematically across sectors um, and in the intersectoral um, coordination mechanisms. Um, and I think it's, it's a good um, sort of call to action for all of us to think about how we do that at multiple levels of, of advocacy as well. So whether, how do we put in place those systems that make it work um, at the country level, but how are we also raising those issues with donors? Um, how are we also raising those issues in kind of different global and regional policy forums? Um, and something that I'm really eager um, to hear from other colleagues, how, how we uplift that and bring it forward. Thanks so much, Susanna. And um, good things to keep in mind as we move forward throughout the day. Um, I want to invite um, Hani to come in now with some thoughts. Thanks, Laura. Um, building on what Susanna said and, and some colleagues have said in the presentation, also in the chat, I just wanted to put a plug in um, about uh, a policy paper that is going to come out uh, in, a, in its um, draft form tomorrow. Um, and that Laura has actually been instrumental in, in developing it. And this is about integration of child uh, protection and social protection. And it's, it's targeted towards people like yourself. I mean, all uh, people that are here, um, those technical experts that are within donor uh, in institutions or governments, but also those um, technical people within organizations that need to do internal advocacy to make sure that social protection programs take into account uh, child protection outcomes and they're not they're not designed in isolation from each other and this we discussed a little bit of this in our in our group but it's a it's a really strong policy paper that will help with the advocacy that each of you as uh, i think frederick has said in the in the chat box need to do within you, with where you where you are in your in your in your country uh, where you work within your organization and if you're a donor within your uh, donor institution. So just keep that in mind. And tomorrow, hopefully tomorrow morning, we'll have this uh, available to you guys. Over to you, Laura, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Annie. And um, yeah, that's a really critical piece is how um, social protection and child protection can feed in together uh, really meaningfully. And it's amazing how social protection has already been, been doing that, but how can we do that really strategically to be, how can we use those interventions to really minimize the child protection risks and enhance the protective factors to enhance child protection outcomes. Um, so hopefully some of our action points will also be moving towards that. So cognizant of the time here, um, we are going to wrap up this session and um, we are going to move towards the second group work session after this. And that group work session will be focusing on, um, that group work session will be focusing on the socio-ecological framing. Thank you very much. <laughs> and um, this is where we'll be looking through the socio-ecological lens and really thinking about now at that level, um, what is happening? What would be the key priorities? But not only that, how does that intersect with the other levels of the socio-ecological frame? Um, there could be an arrow across each of those levels, but um, here we have a dotted line to show the fluidity. Um, and then cultures and socio-cultural socio norms um, filter through each of those levels. And so how do we keep the child at the center within this type of framework? And so I encourage you in your groups, as you look at this particular group, that you will also think towards how is this intersecting with the other groups. So if I'm working with um, the level of governments and nations, we're also looking at how can we be working with communities? How can governments be taking into account cultures in order to, um, to um, enhance the protection and well-being of the child? And so I wish you all well in your next sessions. I'm going to, um, to lead to, wait, just one second. <laughs> We're going to lead towards a 30-minute um, break. 
And um, so in this break, we're going to open up uh, the five breakout rooms again, all of which will be having the same discussions and doing the same activities in small round uh, table discussions along each of these topics. And again, in room three, it'll offer the breakout rooms in French, room four will be Arabic, room five in Spanish. So please select your room in Kiko chat and join in the Zoom meeting now before you leave your computers entirely. This way you'll know that you're in that session when you come back and then take your break. Feel free to join the Zen room, do some yoga, have a stretch, have a snack, um, anything that you need to do uh, in order to come back fresh and feed in together. And so we look forward to um, to working with you in that next session. Um, between the next two group work sessions, we don't have a plenary. So what you'll do is you'll have that group work session, we'll have a quick break, and then we talk about the priority actions before we all come back together again. So that's a quick flagging for the day, but um, enjoy your break and we look forward to seeing you back in plenary after and look forward to seeing you in the smaller groups before that. Thank you so much, everyone.